Good evening. Thanks very much for such a great turnout. Thanks to the League, and uh, thanks for putting us in such great company. It's a wonderful project we just saw. Um, we're going to be talking about Switch Building, which is at 109 Norfolk in the Lower East Side um, between Delancey and Rivington. And um, it's a project uh, that, uh, um, about which we'll speak about two different kinds of threshold. The, the first is conceptual and has to do with uh, overlaps between different constraints and amenities. And the second is, is more disciplinary. But just as a brief overview, uh, the building is a seven-story uh, building with an art gallery on the ground floor and uh, six uh, stories of apartments, five apartments and one penthouse. It's about 15,000 square feet. And uh, the, the, you know, the main interest in this project for us uh, has to do, uh, in this case, in this view, with a, an attempt to, to look at the facade as an occupiable facade in terms of furniture from the inside that allows for views up and down the street. Um, and there's several other issues we're going to get into. Um, the first threshold we're talking about is, is the one produced by the overlap between the constraints imposed by zoning and the, uh, the needs by the client, in this case the developer, for a certain set of amenities. Um, m many of you know uh, about this, but just to go over some of the basics, z zoning in addition to codes and real estate um, conditions serve to package most housing into uh, preconceived uh, uh, sort of normative conditions, and it's very difficult to, to sort of slip out of these boundaries. Um, this project is located in R6 uh, zone, not a contextual zone, but um, one in which the developer can opt to, to uh, you know, apply for contextual zoning and get quality housing, and basically which results in, in, in a, a, in, in a pre-described bulk that is contextual with uh, much, of that, much of that area. Um, many things are defined by, by, by these conditions, but they serve to uh, package them in, in, in a way that it, one is kind of left to put things together in a sort of equation, add the amenities that the developer wants, like the wine fridge or you know, the balcony or what have you, and somehow fit it together. Um, we're going to be speaking about three elements in which we try to uh, challenge some of these limits. Um, the first is uh, the bay window. Uh, the second is the PTAC unit, or package thermal AC unit. And the third is the balcony, not shown here. In, in all of these, we're trying to inter integrate these into some kind of logic that uh, governs the, the design of the facade. Um, the bay windows, first of all, there's no mention in the zoning resolution of a bay window except for this one that we, we found, uh, which it really doesn't talk about it in our uh, specific instance, but which sort of serves to indicate that bay windows are assumed as a kind of uh, contextual or, let's say, just a, a type, typology that is, is sort of acceptable by the city. They aren't allowed if your uh, building is on the street wall. Ours, however, was set back five feet, um, and this is not our project, by the way. <laughs> Ours was set back five feet um, in order to align with our neighbor, and it's one of those conditions the, the, um, the building department asked for in order to, for us to uh, uh, qualify for contextual zoning and higher FAR. Um, so looking at some of the, the types of bay windows that, that exist in New York, in fact, in the Lower East Side, um, the, you know, the, this is one of the least typical ones, which is a sort of single pop-out, but is maybe most similar to its antecedent, the 1870s Victorian bay window, uh, which has a medieval um, ancestor it has to do with the structural bay, but um, in, in the in Victorian era, the bay windows were designed to improve light and air, or rather light and view conditions, but also to better connect to the Victorian garden. What you see with multiple family housing in the 1870s in New York is, of course, a kind of extrusion of this typology. Um, and sometimes in, in a bow a window um, case, is sort of a curved facade, quite voluptuous, something that we see less and less of um, in, in New York. Now, some contemporary examples uh, one could say are kind of applique of, of this, this condition, perhaps just changing the material um, and maybe answering the developer's need in terms of amenities without exactly reframing the question, perhaps. And this one we found really funny. It's in the Lower East Side as well. It's a fire escape that has the sort of aura of a, of a bay window. Um, and then there are other funny things that are sort of in between bay windows and uh, or balconies, I guess. Um, so this is the first slide of our project. Um, what we were trying to do is integrate the bay window as a continuous condition with a facade um, and allow for some of the things that the bay window is intended for in the first place, which is a, a, a seating area. So you can see here, um, I don't know if we have a pointer as well. Yeah, so the little seating area, uh, this is a bamboo wood surround, and uh, it's placed at, at seating height. And it, it's, it's such that um, it doesn't increase the floor area uh, since it's raised above the floor, so it's, it's allowable. Um, but it also produces, I guess, a sort of a depth of facade that is perceived in motion as you walk up and down the street, and uh, again, allowing inhabitants to view up and down 
the street. Um, the other uh, element uh, which we tried to integrate are the PTACs, uh, Package Thermal AC Units, kind of the bane of developer architecture, um, but understandably so because they're, they're quite, uh, there are a lot of positive things to say about them. They're inexpensive, anyone can control them from their own apartment, and they're standardized in terms of construction modules and so on, but they kind of produce this, um, you know, a, a sort of something quite difficult to deal with in a facade. It's applied usually, um, in this case, the architect sort of almost successfully camouflaged them in terms of color bands, but um, they sort of still are there. Funnily though, in pre-AC uh, architecture, there almost is a kind of uh, a clue as to how some of these things could be incorporated within a singular material logic. And these are again all in the Lower East Side. Um, we work with the PTAC manufacturers to ensure the continuation of the warranty by, by, by convincing them that we could separate intake and exhaust uh, from the PTAC within a kind of gradation of little metal panels um, of the same material, galvalume, as the rest of our, of our, of our cladding. And so we created a slightly deep pockets in those regions that then continued the uh, um, cladding as a sort of modulation of dimensions. And uh, one thing that also this, this uh, diagram also indicates was that while we're switching views, we're also switching um, direction of cladding, which is something that's kind of subtle, but you can experience if you walk up and down the street. Um, the, um, so you see here the kind of the, the custom panel that we um, had designed, and we worked closely with our metal fabricator to, to build these, they're sort of pop riveted um, gavelin panels. This is on the rear facade where it's sort of just placed there. We had a little bit more freedom to, to integrate it in the front facade with the, uh, the cladding system. Um, the third and final of these uh, uh, elements is the balcony. Um, now balconies are completely dictated in the zoning resolution. You know, they can only be as half as wide as the width of your rear facade in, in, in buildings of our size. Um, the railing height is three foot eight inches maximum, unless it's like, you know, railing and so on. Um, a lot of things that really sort of produce this as well. Um, and in this case, one could say that the architect gave the developer the minimum definition of a, of a balcony. But we think that, you know, you can't really sit outside. I mean, you can put a table, but it becomes decorative. Um, so we tried to go for, uh, well, and the other thing also is that you, you, you get this uh, stacked balconies, um, which in some ways is great because you have privacy and you have a little bit of a room, but you can't really talk to your neighbor. So we were hoping to produce something more like that, uh, shifting uh, from side to side. And one thing to point out is that we standardize our floor plans in such a way that the switching of the bay window and the balcony on either side could still somehow work. And so we've actually worked with some of the tenants to lay out their, their furnishings. And you know, there's always a question, where's the dining and where's the living? But this sort of opens up those possibilities. And we extended the um, balconies as much as we could, seven feet. We almost cheated a little bit by projecting the, um, the guard an inch and a half out. <laughs> and try to, try to, again, like allow for this communication between neighbors. But also there's a zone of overlap where one can attain some kind of privacy. The second notion of threshold that we're going to talk about is the disciplinary overlap during CA. And um, for us, um, f for this project, CA was basically the entire project because um, we got it um, after they had dug for foundations. So this is how our uh, liability insurance company and how the AAA would like us to work. And this is how we actually work during switch building, where there wasn't really a GC because there was somebody doing the core and shell. And we were um, practically in touch with every single vendor. Um, for many reasons. It's our first building, we were around the corner, um, and we wanted to. So there are some obvious pitfalls, um, um, as evidenced by our extremely long submission folder, um, various submission, too many submission deadlines um, occurring all at once, and way too much correspondence with vendors. We broke all of those rules. Um, the pitfalls are, are obvious. The, the advantages were that um, we communicated very directly with the vendors and were able to um, get a certain level of specificity um, that um, maybe we wouldn't now, <laughs> knowing what we know now. So when we got the, the project, um, the client actually already had a building permit. Um, actually, he got it by accident. He was just filing for a zoning use permit um, with um, just standard boilerplate um, drawings. But anyway, so he got the building permit and then he 
looked for the uh, for for an architect. Um, so very very quickly we came up with the co the concept, the main the, the main idea, the main massing. Um, um, a couple weeks later, and at the same time, we located the foundations and the elevator core. So um, basically, the project for us was this constant, continuous renovation of our own design process, um, and a constant kind of renovation of uh, what, how the contractor interpreted our drawings, which were not always what we drew. So um, um, when we submitted DD, um, that's when the actual closest thing to a GC uh, as there was on the project was hired. Um, actually, he was just the contractor for the core and shell. Um, at this point, we started talking about cladding details. We were kind of working through materials. It's actually this contractor that named the project because after a half hour presentation, he kind of astutely looked at us and said, looks like a light switch. So, um, so he named switch building. Um, but um, because of his name, we actually started taking the concept of switch and applying it to many levels. Um, uh, on the overall facade, on the cladding details, the PTAC units, we, we started pushing it um, once we kind of you know, figured out uh, what, what it could do as a concept. So we're in DD, we're locating the elevator pit. We're also, um, a few months after that, issuing shop drawings for the bay windows. Um, and this is all happening simultaneous to the development of the drawings that um, the first bay window is going up. Balconies. Um, at 100% CD, it became a more traditional uh, uh, process, I guess, where we finally finished our drawings, but at, at the same time, we'd been racing and racing to um, kind of keep up with the, with, with the building. Um, the corn shell was basically done, and at this point we started um, we're talking to even more vendors. Um, this is the construction drawing of the, the ground floor and the typical apartment units. The ground floor is basically divided into entry lobby for the residential units and the gallery that um, becomes a double height gallery in the back. So the section through the gallery, um, I just wanted to talk about the, the skylight. Um, most of you know this, we were completely inexperienced. Um, we found out somewhere during CDs that the skylight had to be three feet back from the property wall, so it produced a kind of, we made it into a, a, a light scoop, basically. This is what it looks like from the inside. This is just this sheathing. The, um, the two main vendors that we were talking to, the, the contractor for the shell and core and, um, and, and this person, the, the metal fabricator, who normally does stairs and this is his first uh, facade, but what the hell, we thought this is our first building too, so. Um, the framing for the canopy uh, was up and at the same time we were working out the um, kind of the system of the um, of the storefront um, so that all the um, fasteners would be completely concealed. Um, so we really, um, the, you know, the advantages of, of this kind of super fast track constant uh, renewal of our own design was that we were really in control of a lot of details. Um, but, you know, the, the day that the metal fabricator cut, accidentally cut the radiant heating pipe uh, of a floor while installing this stair, that's when you realize this is really a bad idea because he had no idea that the radiant flooring was there. Anyway, um, more details under construction. This is the penthouse stair. Um, so I'm just gonna walk through some uh, of the final photos. This is the entrance of the building. You see the, um, the swinging doors of the, the gallery and then the wood-lined uh, residential lobby. The gallery also deals with light um, uh, and, and the uh, kind of difference um, 
uh, in perception, the switching of perception in a different way. We had been staring at the steel beams of the galleries for so long because the project had really stalled at a certain point. We had been staring at it for so long that we realized that it would be really a shame to just cover it with a, a flat sheet of something. Um, and so we tried to keep the expression of the steel with the sawtooth um, kind of ceiling, which solves an acoustic problem, but more importantly is picking up on the same kind of switching idea of switching perception as you walk into the gallery as opposed to out um, towards the skylight as opposed to walking out towards the um, street. This is a view of the um, residential lobby. We even you know, had to deal with the postman because we were developing a custom mailbox. <laughs> he had to roof it. This is a view of the penthouse stair, which cantilevers um, entering into the bathroom, and the view from the most private space of the house bridging back into the city. Thank you. <laughs>